Hello, everyone. Welcome to UGA Sports Rumors versus Facts presented by Julie's Bookkeeping. We'll get to them, more on them in just a second. Thankful that they partner here with the show. But I am Blaine Gilmer. That is Trent Smallwood. We were at vacation, all kinds of other stuff going on last week. So now we are back at it, covering Georgia football recruiting. We've kind of been all over the place. Trent, you went down and covered the, the Future 50 Jed, who's, who won't be with us tonight, but Jed, Roddy, and Patrick, they went down and they were covering the next gen, the five star next gen event that, that Rivals had. So there's been a lot going on, not just in the class of 2024, but even beyond. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the same at, at both of those places. You hear, you hear George's name a good bit. I, I was down at IMG and it was, there was 50 players there and every single player uh, that, this player mentioned Georgia, you might want to go interview. This player mentioned Georgia, you might go and interview. And so every every player that uh, – I mean, there's a ton of players that are interested in Georgia, uh, you know, beyond the 24 class into the 25 class and even further down that Georgia's starting to build those relationships with. Yeah, and, and in terms of the 2024 class, we already saw at the tail end of June saw Michael Uini, and, and we haven't been able to talk about him – really on the show since since that commitment went down on the 30th, uh, ending the month of June with a big, literally and figuratively, commitment from a four-star offensive tackle that that Trent, you know, six foot eight, 325 pounds, he says when he's in his playing weight, he told me he weighed in at 335 at Georgia because all he'd been doing is eating on these OVs. He said he had to, had to trim back a little bit after uh, they've been feeding him pretty good over there. But talk to us just a little bit about what you – see out of him and what that addition means to this Georgia 2024 class, particularly with what could be coming behind it this week. Yeah, I think, I think you have uh, a couple guys, um, even, you know, what was coming this coming week that could play offensive tackle, offensive guard. I think um, that you is a, is the offensive tackle in my opinion, uh, six, eight, three thirty moves well for the size. Um, you know, he's just, a massive human being that uh, uh, you look at him and he, and he don't have a lot of bad weight necessarily. You know, you talked about him. He's been on official visits, it's been, uh, you know, he's got uh, a little official visit weight that he's probably put on, but uh, nothing that he can't uh, take care of, but um, you know, over a, over a uh, summer camp, but he's, uh, he's, he's got, he's massive. He's got good size. He's got good feet. Um, he, he's, it, he, he looks like he's long, and I, I don't know his measurements, but he looks like he's long. He's just a, another uh, – they want to get big at that position. They want to bully people at that position, and that's exactly what they're getting uh, in, in this edition. No, I mean, it, people thought, and he, he said that it was reasonable for people to think it was Alabama and Michigan kind of going because those are the places that kind of most of the buzz had been around. But he said dating all the way back to last July when he worked out at Georgia, came over for a camp – uh, really just kind of fell in love with, uh, you know, what Stacey Searles was saying to him, the development Georgia had. And he said that all those feelings kind of came back when Georgia got that last OV there. So that was that was a very big, very strategic uh, o OV placement there for Georgia in terms of landing him. Georgia now has three offensive linemen committed in the class of 2024. Another massive human being, Marcus Harrison uh, from New York, so you've got now. So now you have um, Uini, who is from Texas, Harrison, who's from New York, and then Malachi Tolliver, who is a in-state guy. He's originally from Louisville, but he's uh, but he is plays at Cartersville High School here in Georgia. So three and you know Trent, there's three more big decisions that Georgia is right in the middle of here, coming on the fifth in Daniel Calhoun. The seventh, um, that that well, the eighth, the seventh in Nair Daniels, and the eighth in Marquez Easley. Those are the order that those are going to be announcing in this week. Uh, just kind of start with Calhoun and and tell us, you know, what your thoughts are of how these guys 
if they do indeed select Georgia, how they could, you know, impact this offensive line class and what Stacey Searles is trying to build there. You know, what's interesting to me is when you look back, I guess it was about six or seven years uh, before Pittman, I get right before Kirby, um, they were, they were doing, uh, they were getting a lot of guards that could play tackle. Um, and, and it's really reversed now. They're, they're really taking five tackles and, and, uh, you know, um, Daniel Calhoun's a guy that's probably could end up at guard. He's, he could also end up at, at tackle, but he, he's a guy that you can shift inside and play at guard. Um, you know, he, he's athletic. He's, I guess, the top uh, offense lineman in the state, which which would be big to get. And, um, you know, I, I, I like I like what Georgia's done in this class uh, up to this point. And, and you know, if, if Georgia could land these next three, it would be, uh, you know, gigantic – just just from a versatile they've, they've needed help at tackle they need help in that depth and um you're getting five guys or you know five or six guys in this class that can play the tackle position but also shift in and athletic enough and, and able to pull uh and, and play that guard position and it's trend it's not unreasonable whether through the draft or through eligibility that georgia loses four guys off their offensive line after this season so they're going to have to replenish some guys and then we actually have a question about the 2024 offensive line that you know we are recruiting show but time to time we'll take a we'll take a question on the current team or the future team uh as it were here on our vault question so we'll get to those in just a minute but even some of those guys that are competing right now as in the depth spots you're not guaranteed to keep everybody. There may be a guy or two decide to leave in the portal. So it's always important to add those numbers. Kirby Smart has historically liked to bring in five, six guys in an offensive line class each and every year because he and the Georgia staff believe that football is physics. If you're bigger than the people across from you, you're going to be able to move them, and if you can move them from point A to point B against their will, then you're going to have a better chance to win the football game, and that is what Georgia has demonstrated during Kirby Smart's tenure there. They're trying to follow that up with a lot of these guys here uh, that are that are already on board and could be on board by the end of the week when it comes through things. Um, you know, a lot of speculation was out there it kind of – People not knowing what was going on with Marquez Easley when he dropped that top three and Georgia wasn't in it. But we kind of told everybody, just be patient. I think Georgia's going to be fine working the, their their way through this thing. And uh, it seems that right now, based on everything we hear, that, that Georgia is in a great position with all three of those guys, um, Calhoun, Nair Daniels, and Marquez Easley. But it just goes to show, Trent, that the world of recruiting, and we'll get into some other – recruitments that are kind of volatile and stuff right now kj bolden's other stuff like that but the world of recruiting in 2023 is absolutely nuts it's not just nil it's social media it's all this kind of stuff that is involved in it yeah it's i mean it, it you, you got the guys who are uh, dropping top schools and and you know you, and picking another school and then you got the nil and you got the i mean it, it's it's a whole it's a whole thing and, it, and it's kind of got hectic um but um, there, there's a lot of stuff to filter through, uh, and what I've, you know, maintained is, uh, to, you know, that UGA sports just keep, uh, following us. Cause we keep going with what we trust at UGA sports and who, uh, and our sources and, and trying to give you up to date information and, and, um, no matter what you see, you know, might, might be out there on social media or whatever it might be, uh, keep following us at UGA sports. And we're going to try to keep you up to date on, on everything that, w that we can tell you at the moment. Only, only yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it is. Uh, it's important that we do note that because I've been telling people on the on the board. You know, one thing we we like to do is we like to keep our subscribers as informed as they can absolutely possibly be. But also, a lot of us have certain ways of getting getting information and stuff like that that we feel an obligation to keep the confidence of the people that we're that we're talking to. So. It's a double-edged sword on how that goes, but if you are on the vault, you will be aware of what's going on and be have your finger on the pulse of how Georgia football recruiting is going because uh, whether it's myself, whether it's Trent, whether it's Jed, whether it's Roddy, whether it's other guys across the team, they all bring in different pieces of information, and we have a vast team over there, so it is a, it is a great place to be. 
And one reason we're able to do that kind of stuff and bring you this information and bring you these shows is because of partnerships like with Julie, the bookkeeper. Uh, our show is presented by Julie's Bookkeeping. Uh, goes by Julie, the bookkeeper online. You can you can schedule a call with them going Julie, the bookkeeper. That's B O O K K E E P E R dot com, and you know you can schedule a call. But if you want to get a free thirty minute consultation, just make it real easy because they're Georgia fans. Julie is and her husband is, and you can go to godogs.juliethebookkeeper.com. It's a direct calendar link. You can schedule a 30-minute consultation that's absolutely free. And what Julie the Bookkeeper does is they save you money and time because you're not a bookkeeper. So why would you have to keep up with that with your small business? That is what people pay Julie the Bookkeeper to do. Uh, it's not it's not something that that you want to always have on your plate. And they have found that outsourcing bookkeeping can help increase profitability for small businesses by up to $7,000 a year. So there can be quite the savings in there. Julie and Chris, big time Georgia fans. They raised their son to be a Georgia fan. He, uh, Even though he ended up straight and going to FSU, he's still a lifelong Georgia fan. Uh, and now now they say he hates the, the Florida Gators twice with the FSU and Georgia in his, in his background there. So they, they raised their son to be a bulldog they want to help you as fellow georgia bulldog fans and you can help them out as well make sure you visit julie the bookkeeper um trent i don't know if you've ever had to do stuff with a uh with your own you know whether it's taxes bookkeeping stuff like that it get a he headache so i want to i want to call somebody like julie the bookkeeper to to get it straight for me yeah. Um, <laughs> you mentioned that I, I got all kinds of stuff that I need to get taken care of. And, and, uh, um, you know, Joey's book, bookkeeping is the, uh, the best place to go as a dog fan. You know, you, you, you if you're a dog fan, you want to go to a dog fan cause you know, you, they, they're going to have your back through everything. So, um, hit up Joey's bookkeeping for, uh, for your, for your bookkeeping on, on anything and everything. Absolutely. All the bookkeeping needs, JulieTheBookkeeper.com. All right, now let's uh, let's get to it here. We've talked a little bit. Georgia, we like where they sit for three offensive linemen coming up. Uh, Calhoun, Nair Daniels, and Marquez Ellis. Uh, Marquez Easley, we've talked a little bit about the bookends there of Calhoun and Easley. Calhoun on the fifth, uh, Easley on the eighth. Nair Daniels is a guy that a, a high-ranking source somebody that is definitely a hundred percent in tune and involved with this georgia program has actually relayed trent i've heard that they believe nair daniels if he does indeed join this this georgia class on july 7th that he could end up being the best offensive tackle in the entire class period they think that's the kind of athleticism he has he's he's got a little extra weight on him right now he probably needs to play it he's at 370 he needs to play down towards 335 but that's where scott sinclair and everybody comes into play an athletic guy that can get out in space and you just go watch the open and play trend of his highlights and you can see what he can do getting out in space yeah and, and the good thing about when you come to georgia um, you're, you're really, you don't have to play year one. You can take that year, you can develop your body, you, you can get in the rotation, but you're also, you, you're in the, you're going up against the best D-line in the country majority of times at practice. So you get that year to really develop, um, especially with guys like Ernest Green and M Monroe Freeling already on campus. Uh, you get that you get that development time, but yeah, he's a guy that just another massive human being that we've been talking about. It's six eight, uh, you said three seventy. He's listed at three fifty three on his rivals prospect uh, rivals card, and he's uh, uh, you know a, a big move. He, he can he can dominate you up front. He's long. He, he's hard to get around. He's just um, an another guy in this class that that you know. Stacy Searles is bringing in that he he received all this criticism, you know, coming into the year about uh, can he recruit? Uh, you know, nobody's going to be a recruit at Sam Pittman level. That's just not going to happen. But he is bringing in. Uh, he's getting the guys that he wants, and that's that's the that's the key. And he, this is another guy that he wants. Is that Nair Daniels is a guy that he's he's highlighted since day one, and uh, he, he's he's been a want since then. And I and I think 
Georgia sits in a good position. If Georgia can land him along with the other uh, two that's coming up, they're going to have a very good uh, – it's going to be a very good tackle class, very good offensive line class, and this is going to be what they needed because we, we talked about earlier this year what one position they needed to hit on this class, offensive line, and that would that would uh, solve that you know kind of mystery up in there. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, they could end up taking six. You know, it's not necessary that somebody's going to get pushed out or something like that. I've been told that Georgia definitely uh, would, would take six offensive linemen because – I mean, the, the quality that they would be able to bring in. And you always have to say, hey, if this happens, because when there's this kind of much, when there's this much momentum and when there's this much all pointing towards one school, you have to think just law of averages that something's going to go wrong <laughs> at the last minute for, for a team and something changes. So you, you can never rule that out. But all indications are that it's going to be a massive week for Georgia recruiting on the offensive line front, and really should, uh, you know, change the perception of even some people on our board of what uh, Stacy Searles is doing uh, recruiting over there uh, for the Georgia offensive line front of things. Okay, so that is offense. Now on defense, there's two prospects out there that made official visits, um, and we we've got a. a they made official visits the last week of June official visits, and we have a question on one of them that we'll go more in detail on. But Joseph Janea Janye, uh, he is announcing his school of choice on July 12th. Heavy Georgia favorite right here with this one. I mean, the, the guy has not been bashful about talking about his, his love of the Georgia program and what they have done in their recruitment of him. And his teammate, Justin Williams, a five-star linebacker there out of Conroe, Texas as well, Oak Ridge High School, he was on that official visit with him. I talked to Justin Williams today, Trent. I'll have a story out on him tomorrow. And this is a this is a Georgia-Oregon battle straight up. So you see the, the Kirby coaching tree right there already having some battles with Dan Lanning going head-to-head -head with Kirby for a five-star linebacker. We'll see how that ends up ends up going, um, but in terms of those two guys, uh, just kind of I know you've watched them, you, you've seen what they what they can do. Just kind of talk about okay, if if Georgia were to get both of those guys out of Conroe, Texas, what would that look like? Especially with and we have a question on Demarcus Riddick at the inside linebacker part uh, position. If he ends up going elsewhere, um, what Justin Williams can mean. I think I think Justin Williams would be a big pickup. Just you know, talking about Riddick, there's just so much uncertainty there. I would say 50-50, uh, uh, you know, up in the air with Riddick right now of where he ultimately lands. I know he's got the relationship with Schumann. He's built that. He's been to Alabama twice. I know over the last month or so, and and he has not decommitted yet, and he still remains committed to Georgia. And you know, Georgia felt good about him coming out of their official visit, but. Adding adding a player like Justin Williams kind of um, eases the pain if something was to happen towards the end. You know, Georgia would love that duo of linebackers. Um, you know, it, the way Georgia's been recruiting that position, just adding those two to the mix would be unreal. But it just it just eases the pain of it, if something did happen um, with with Riddick and he did flip to Alabama, you would have Justin Williams because Justin Williams is you know he's a guy you can blitz. He's a guy that can cover. He's a guy you can play in multiple positions. He, he's, he might be a guy you come in year one and be in like a, covered, a coverage package or a blitz package. Uh, he's just that athletic. Um, kind of like a Jalen Walker uh, was, an inside linebacker guy, can line up on the edge, can rush the passer, thing, things of that nature. Yeah, so that would that would be interesting there. And then and then his teammate, uh, Joseph Janea um, a guy that could, you know, he could really – play some of that five technique kind of like Justin Green, but he can also – he's big enough where he may be able to slide down and play three technique at some times, especially if he adds a little bit of weight. Um, what's your what's your thoughts on, you know, it's looking like uh, George is the heavy favorite going into July 12th. So that's between now <laughs> – so in the next nine days, Georgia could very realistically add four commitments to this class and jump up from 22 commits to 26 and even further their lead – on the number one ranked class in the uh, in 2024, but tell us what you what your thoughts are on JJ JJA. 
Yeah, he's he, he, like you mentioned. He's a, a five tech guy um, in their in their kind of base personnel. Uh, can slide in a defensive tackle in their nickel, and, and you know he's got a quick first step, plays with good leverage, and it, you know that leverage allows him to slide in and play on the inside. So I, I love you know Georgia has addressed you know with, as we're talking about the offense line, they had to address the five tech position too, and they've addressed that with Justin Green. And if they could land, uh, you know, a John Jay too, um, that would be addressing that position as well, especially in their in their base set. And when they have to go big, you can slide him out to the five tech, and um, you know he, he's he, he's got that ability to rush the passer, but he's also got the ability to uh, you know stuff the run with the leverage he plays with. Everybody talks about you know wide receiver recruiting and stuff like that, and and that's some of the biggest things that we have trend in terms of the board and vault and all this kind of stuff that we we have threads on on a daily basis. But really, like you just mentioned, coming into this class, you and I and Jed, we all answered, okay, when people would ask us, hey, what is, what's the biggest area of need in this class on each side of the ball? And we said five technique on defense and the offensive line on offense. And Georgia appears to be – answering those questions and filling those voids in a very, very big way uh, and, and wrapping things up here in July would appear with that. We predicted a few weeks ago before these dates were ever publicly announced, we told you that the, the Georgia offensive line class would be wrapped up by July 10th, that it would be over with. Um, and that, that certainly looks to be the, be the case here. Um, so let's get to some of our vault questions here. Uh, Bulldog with a interesting – and by the way, Bulldog, if you don't know his his stick and why he's called Bulldog, well, he's going to he's gonna need uh, maybe he, – he might need some breathing treatments by the end of this week because he's going to be he's gonna be a busy guy with uh, the bevy of Georgia commitments that are going to be coming in the next nine days. But um, who's one player Georgia is trending for more than others are saying, Trent? And, uh, you know – you can't answer Arch Manning because he's now at Texas, so you can't. That's you can't answer that anymore. Uh, but what? Who is the the person that George is trending for more than others are saying? Um, you know that's a tough question because we try to give uh, you know all of our insight uh, out on the vault. So uh, I think UGA Sports is well aware who we think is trending towards Georgia. I, I would say. Uh, one guy that you know is is not event announced until the fall is Nate Frazier um, that we don't have, have not talked about as much, and then another guy that still communicates with Georgia, still communicates with Raul is Jeremiah Smith. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I know Ohio State. He's committed to Ohio State. He's remained committed to Ohio State, and but there's a wide receiver coach over there at Ohio State. It's going to be in for a lot of big jobs here come uh, you know November December time and. Um, you know that that could that could put a swing on things if that was to happen. So Georgia continuing to build that relationship, communi- continuing to communicate there. Um, I would say that's a player just to to keep an eye on. Yeah, I think uh, I think you know a lot of people are discounting the whole Ryan Wingo and Mike Matthews situation. And listen. I've been one that said Mike Matthews is going to be an extremely hard pull because it just seems like he's a guy that has kind of just been trending out of state, right? I think one of those two guys, I think Georgia's definitely trying. You mentioned Jeremiah Smith. I, I think that if that happens, that would be at the very end. But I wouldn't just totally discount those two. Um, I know that that some people are throwing out predictions for Wingo to Texas and stuff like that, but some of those predictions – you know, are, are meaningless. Okay. Some, some of them get changed all the time. So the thing about it is, is that, you know, you, you talk to the people involved and there's, you know, there's still communication going on as of the last week with Brian McClendon, Brian Wingo, Brian McClendon, Mike Matthews. So those seem to be the two guys that they're still really pursuing after they've worked out and things like that. And, and Trent, you know, and we can tell people, if you're going to play receiver at Georgia, you you will have worked out personally for the Georgia the Georgia staff probably multiple times. And if you don't, 
you're you're not going to end up playing receiver at Georgia. They want to see you work out in person and, and go through all the different things. So I think that uh, that those are two guys that not necessarily trending for Bulldog, but but guys that you I wouldn't just write off completely right now. Yeah, and the one thing that you know you mentioned working out for Georgia. The one thing they do is um, they they get your time and and they want they they want to look at your forty time. They want to look at um, it is your are, are you are is your time improving? Uh, you know, over since working out as a sophomore, then you're working out as a junior. So um, speed is a big thing to the Georgia stuff. You know, whether it be defensive back, uh, I guess it's every position. You know, speed's a big a big deal and. Um, that that is something uh, you know they they take into account when they're when they're working you out. Yeah, uh, David Williams says here on YouTube, word is Demarcus is probably flipping to Bama. I wouldn't rule out you know Auburn either. Both of those schools over there are working him hard, but we'll so we'll see uh, how that all ends up. But yeah, Georgia, our role here is you're committed to you're not. He's still committed, as Trent said after a couple of visits. But um, yeah, so I want to mix in some of these YouTube questions here. As we go along, there's some debate here between who's a better athlete and uh, Ellis Robinson or, or uh, DeAndre Baker from the Kirby era. So uh, that 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 could be an interesting hypothetical down the road that we might might be able to talk about. But Suspense 12 says, how many commits are you thinking in July? And could you possibly post any dates? So we've talked a lot about the dates. Um, there's a high possibility of getting four commits in the next nine days. So that would raise you up to to uh, to twenty six. Chris Jones possibly uh, pops off a, a commitment in the month of, in the month of July. Uh, KJ Bolden is August fifth, and we'll talk about him. We've got questions on him coming up coming up next. So you know that's just outside of July. But I mean, I I told everybody back on like. June 21st that the over under between then and July 10th for uh, commitments was six and a half. Everybody told me I was crazy. It's going to be right there at that number, about six guys. Once you get to, to about uh, July 12th, if things continue to go as they look that they're going, um, maybe another couple guys, I don't know what the timeline is for a guy like a Cam Michael or somebody like that, uh, you know, Trent, but we'll, we'll see where, where everybody where everybody stands on stuff in terms of announcements, I think you could see that number end up being five commits in July for, for Georgia, five, five, maybe six if somebody pops early. Yeah. And I know, and I know there's, you know, still some unknowns, like you mentioned, uh, Michael and, you know, looking down to like Aiden Breland, I know he's not, you know, expected to announce right now, but um, just guys that the Georgia still targeting that, that could, you know, uh, pop it hey, in. Justin, but Justin Williams, for that matter, could decide to pull the trigger in July. So. Yes. Yep. So, um, yeah, you, you're, you're looking at four. Uh, you know, uh, you, you're pretty comfortable with the, the four number, but, you know, they definitely could go up to six and, you know, maybe seven in early August. So, um, with KJ and Nelson. Yeah. And I know, I know too that you said, I know Frazier has an official visit to Georgia in the fall but does he have a announced I, I can't remember does he have a date set of when he wants to do a commitment or could that be at, at any time yeah i don't think he has a specified date yet that i know of but um yeah it i mean it, of course it could happen at any time and I, you know I, i've said look back at that uh unofficial to georgia um or you know earlier this um uh, yeah in june, june the same june, weekend as chauncey like bowens june. so i, I said that that visit right there was huge just just to have uh you know something to compare other visits to in this month and then if this does go in the fall and georgia still got that official visit sitting there um they, they could you know be able to close the deal if if you know it doesn't happen before then and it's not unprecedented either that georgia has success with that type of scenario look at damon wilson last year you know there was there was some you know back and forth on his recruitment all the way to the end but it was that unofficial official visit that that he was on you know for multiple multiple day uh unofficial visit that really uh you know really kind of tipped things over in george's way i believe with some of the guys he was around now the million dollar question here trent shane uga dogs wants to know how confident are you that we georgia land kj bolden so if you had to put a percentage number on it what how do you feel 
percentage wise as we stand today? You know, there's a lot of different factors that goes into this recruitment. I would say, I mean, you know, as of today, probably 60, 40, um, you know, in confidence as far as Georgia goes, but you know, Ohio, Ohio state has definitely made this interesting. Uh, again, a lot of factors goes into it. And, um, but I, I do think, uh, the relationship wise, Georgia has been able to, you know, be there. Then, then they also got Raola now at Buford and, and I know their families, uh, communicate pretty, uh, pretty regularly. <laughs> So, Brett Womack's um, pretty confident here, Trent. 97. Go with 97. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not going to go that high, but, uh, I mean, this is a five-star recruit that is, you know, you know, being uh, recruited hard. And, uh, you know, Ohio State is desperate to be good on defense. That's what I'll say. That They are they are des desperate at this time to be good on defense with, with the output they put out the last couple of years, and they're, they're going all out for, for defensive recruits. Yeah, the question is, will Ryan Day still be there by the time those those kids get there? It'll be interesting to interesting to see on that. Um, I would put my percentage at fifty five percent on on Bolton and, and George George's favor, just a slight lead for George. I think that the relationship, being in state, Raul, all those factors that you listed do do play in in George's favor. Um, but old donut dog is on to something over there. There's that, there's that Buford uh, kind of wall you have to kick down, so to speak, if you're Georgia and, and uh, get that out of the way because just weird things happen with guys who are for all the world look like they're headed to Georgia and then suddenly they aren't. So um, we'll see, see how things end up. Uh, but I think as of right now, very tight race. And I think it's going to come all the way down to – right there at August 5th before anybody knows anything official uh, to get that one out of the way. All right. Uh, Space Pop 3 says, what's the latest on Breland, Frazier? We've already talked about Frazier uh, and Justin, Justin Williams. So we've talked a little bit about Justin Williams. Do they decide before the season or all the way to December? I think, I think you'll see Frazier end up committing – to the school of his choice sooner rather than later. I, I just don't I just don't think that that'll drag on. Breedland, I could see taking some more time, but I think Justin Williams will definitely be done way before his senior year gets gets going. Yeah, I, I would say um, from earliest to latest, I would go with Justin Williams and Frazier than Breland. Um, I think Breland's further away from a decision right now. Um, I think Georgia did have a good visit there. I think Georgia is very uh, much in the mix for Breland to, to you know, land another defensive tackle, which which they're looking for in this class. But I would say Justin Williams is closer to the decision, and then Frazier's probably slightly behind him with Breland uh, further away. Yeah, and in terms of where they stand, uh, I, I think Breland is very much so in the same boat as um, as a Justin Williams. I think Oregon and Georgia are two very prominent uh programs there in his recruitment um and then you got nate frazier who i think georgia has a has a lead there honestly i think georgia's in, in really good shape did alabama close the gap a little bit on their their ov probably so um but then you know he's, he's visited some other places oregon as well texas a&m so we'll see how it all holds out for all those guys it's amazing how many guys down here towards the end that georgia and oregon are going toe-to-toe -to -toe with so Dan Lennon learned a little something from uh, from Kirby Smart there in terms of the the recruiting trail, and we'll see see how things uh, end up in those head to head battles. So now let's head to our next question, which comes from Seabuck Eleven: Is Georgia still in it for Amari Jefferson? Trent, everything I'm hearing, you know, I'm sure uh, I'm sure Brian McClendon and Georgia are going to stay in touch with him. They always do, but I just feel like that one is headed headed elsewhere. Um, you know, Tennessee, Alabama, both, both very prominent in that recruitment. Yeah. And I didn't feel good about it coming into the official visit and um, just based on what I was hearing and and then following the official visit, you know, Georgia had a, a little bit of steam, but I, I still think uh, Georgia's on the outside looking in for Jefferson right now. Yep. It, it'll be interesting to see, see how that ends up. Uh, last warrior. How did the suck eyes jump UGA and Miami for Justin Scott? Seems like that announcement came out of nowhere. Lastly, is he locked in or will this go to December? 
Trent, all I'll say is that recruitment was all over the place. And typically when that when it's like that and there's people that are involved in the recruitment that aren't members of the family, things get crazy. And I think that tells you all you need to know about how that ended up with him going to Ohio State. Yeah, pretty that pretty much uh, <laughs> covers what you need to know. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Miami was trending – Early before Notre Dame, uh, Notre Dame was trending. Uh, Notre Dame was going to land his commitment, you know, uh, earlier this spring or you know late winter, and it, that momentum kind of went to Miami. Uh, Georgia was the team that you know he was looked upon that that kind of got him to to postpone that announcement, you know, that he was going to go to Notre Dame, and then Michigan got real involved, and and you know I'd heard that Michigan was going to land his commitment, uh, you know, this summer, and then all of a sudden it went to uh, Ohio State last minute. So, like I said, um, Ohio so State's desperate. Do you to be think good. it's over with? I, I would not say. I, I I do not have. If you put my confidence meter up that this recruitment's over, it would be at about a ten. So, um, I, I think this is far from over. I'm not saying Georgia is is going to get back involved yeah. and land him. Not but saying I, that it'll end up in Georgia's favor, but I don't know that he ends up at Ohio State. Is yeah, what I'm saying. It, it's it's far from over. Um, that's what I'll say. How many? Okay, so we got this from. Uh, let me see. Oh, that. Sorry, they got it on the. I got it scrolling across the bottom here. Let me change that. All right, R. Hall says, "How many silence does Georgia still have?" Um, so, silent commits right now. I think, based on based on what I've been told of who is made it aware that they want to be a Georgia Bulldog. I think you're, you're still looking at five guys. I think that number lessens dramatically this month. I mean, obviously, the, as we go along, the silence are going to dwindle, but there's there's going to be some silent commits that come off the board pretty quick. Yeah, and, and the thing is, there's already been some silent commits that have went elsewhere, um, you know, during yeah. this month. So um, that that's that's kind of what one we've been point, At one point said – I will, I'm hey I'm 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 in I'm going to come to, to Georgia but who knows what they told other people a, as well so I mean that is uh, that's a, that's the interesting thing I had one I had one source uh, tell me Trent it was like hey you know that's good to know that they said something because until X person uh, says something to somebody outside the building it's not really real you know what I'm saying like they can tell they can tell us inside the building all they want to but until they tell somebody outside the building it's not real so we'll see uh we'll see how some of that ends up but it is interesting to see how many commits do we end up does georgia end up with in this class so you overall when it's all the dust settles all said and done how many does georgia sign you think trent i'm gonna say 32 33 um somewhere around that number i think is where it'll ultimately land at i think um, you know, the portal is still going to be active, but with, with there being no limit on the class and Georgia having a lot of guys that they're going to lose, um, they're going to lose in this class, whether it be uh, draft eligible guys, um, you know, the, the maybe, a you know, we, we saw the, the punter, the punter could be gone. You know, they're, they're going to lose a lot of guys from this class, uh, from this team. And I think with it having a no limit now, just the 85 you're going to see Georgia fill all those spots, and I think you're going to look at 32, 33. Could could bump up to a little bit more, but um, I think I think you when it all settles, be 32, 33. Yeah, I agree with you on that number. And I think too, when it comes down to it, you know, now that initial 25 counter rule is out the window. All you got to do is manage the 85. And to your point, what you said, don't talk, don't think I'm crazy when I say this, but that 15 guys that Georgia had drafted in 2021. They could break the record. They could break their own record this year. I think there could be as many as 17 guys, 17, 18 guys drafted from this Georgia team, or at least have draftable grades. Particularly if in people in the chat were talking about it, if Carson Beck goes off the way that a lot of people expect he's able to go off, not Carson, listen, Carson Beck's extremely talented, but simply for the fact that he's going to have an elite offensive line around him and more playmakers than Georgia has had in a long, long time. Uh, that if he just plays within himself, distributes the football effectively, and doesn't turn it over, he's going to have four thousand yards passing and a huge, huge numbers. So, because you know Bobo is going to push the ball down the field, 
um, from his, his time there. So he could end up getting drafted. I mean, there's a lot of guys that are going to come off this roster. There's going to be guys transfer out, probably five, six, seven guys transfer out after the year. So let's say there's – let's conservatively say there's 14 or 15 drafted. You add another seven or eight. I mean, that's putting you, that's putting you at, at what, you know, 23 – to somewhere between 23, 25 guys, and then you'll probably lose some to eligibility as well. So, I mean, there, there's going to be a lot of guys leave this football team after the 2023 season is over, and they got to bring in new ones. I think you're going to look at close to 10 guys drafted just from the offensive side of the ball. I mean, you're, you talk about quarterback. You got two running backs that can get drafted, and Milton and, and Dejon Edwards. You got uh, Lad McConkey, Ra Ra Thomas, and, and, um, that, my mind's gone blank. Dom, Dominant Lovett could end yeah, up getting Dominic drafted Lovett. this year. I mean, I mean, if Arian Smith was to come up and have a big year, um, then you got uh, Brock Bowers, of course. You got three or four offensive linemen that could, uh, you know, that are going to be draft eligible to go. You know, uh, Van Pan, uh, Van Pan Granger is going to go. Um, I mean, you just you got a. I mean, the offense is just loaded with talent, and that's not even taking into account the, the defense that you're going to see probably five, six guys draft off the defense. So, um, you know, like you said, that number that number 15 could get drafted, but, you know, as far as the overall number, you're, you, you're definitely looking at um, 32, 33 that you're going to have to fill spots for. Um, and, and it might come, uh, you know, Georgia's always hunting the transfer portal too, and, you know, they'll get guys picked from their roster as well uh, like they do every year, so. I mean, there's all kinds of scenarios out there. What if what if Nylon Green wins the cornerback job and with his freakish athleticism puts that down a great season and ends up, you know, going pro the next year? I mean, it's just there's all kinds of scenarios. Georgia's going to lose guys. They have to replenish. So I think 32, 33 is a good number to to kind of to kind of uh, guesstimate around there. Um D Frank at 31, what is the probability that Woodyard or else Robinson will flip from UGA? Uh, has Georgia moved away from Woodyard a bit? And would uh, so we'll talk about the, the last question next. But what's the probability that Woodyard or Robinson will flip from Georgia? Trent, without getting specific and saying, you know, which one, I mean, uh, what do, what's your um, what's your thoughts that Georgia ends up if you had to place a percentage on Georgia signing both of those guys, what do you think it would be? Uh, I mean, signing both of those guys, uh, I would say, you know, 75, 80%. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I think, uh, I think Georgia is, uh, Robinson is a guy that Georgia has been in for a long time and has, uh, you know, that, that relationship's grown and he, he's wanted to play for Georgia. Um, I think I, I feel a little bit better about Robinson than Woodyard just because Woodyard's taken a lot more visits and, uh, yeah. and I think Georgia, you know, I'm not saying they prefer one or the other. I'm just saying, um, from a um, need standpoint, they would want that. They, they definitely want to keep Robinson. They want to keep both of them, of course. But that Robinson is a guy that you know Georgia um, really wants to keep in this class because he might be the number one cornerback in this class, to be honest. So, um, I think I think Georgia wants to keep both. But I think if one did flip, uh, you know, just um, you know, making a guess, it would be Woodyard. Yeah, I mean, I. I... I would have, if I was answering this question at the beginning of June, I would have said, "Hey, it's locked. Both of them are going to be in the class." But now, uh, you know, there are there are rumors, and I think they are warranted that there, things have moved a little bit with with both of those guys. Alabama uh, pushing hard for for both of them. I think it's not out of the realm of possibility that Alabama ends up getting one of them. Um, but I think that you know when it comes down to it. It'll be interesting to see what happens on August 5th uh, with, with K.J. Bolden. I'll say that uh, at the safety position and and see where you go from there. Yeah, and, and I also think you got to take into account, uh, I mean, if, if a flip did happen, I, I think it might not happen this summer. I think it could it could move into the fall, and you have to take into account that, the you know, what 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 are these teams going to like on the field? You know, we talked about um, – the momentum certain teams had last spring or last summer, and and you know that, that all that momentum kind of went away when the when the game times come. I, I in in my honest opinion, I think Alabama's going to struggle a bit this year without a you know I, I think they're going to struggle at the quarterback position. They've beaten teams over the past few years with at the quarterback position um, with guys like Bryce Young and 
Tua Tua and um, and Jalen Hurts and those guys. So I'm interested to see the product Alabama's going to put on the field, which could you know um, ultimately impact these flips that we're referring to right now. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll see how they end up. And then what do you project Georgia's offensive line to look like in 2024? It's way early for that, but uh, it's an interesting question, one that I wanted to, to address here. So if you had to ballpark it, Trent, and say, okay, what does what the offensive line look like in 2024? What would you what would you say there? Ernest Green at left tackle, Monroe Freeling at right tackle, um, probably a Micah Morris at guard maybe. Um, Dylan Fairchild at the other one. Dylan Fairchild at the other, or maybe Austin. Blasky Either Austin Blasky or Jared Wilson at center. Oh, at center. Yeah, I, I, that's, it's amazing how, you know, if Georgia loses all those guys that, you know, except Ernest Green off this offensive line, how that one is going to be just as formidable when it comes in there. I mean, those guys are going to be well, – they're going to be hungry and they're going to be nasty. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, that offensive line come to fruition in 2024 as well all right so let's let's see where we left off here gop uga in an interview with a recruit has one just flat out told you that nil is important so whether it's on record or off record has anybody you don't have to name a name but has anybody just said hey nil matters this this, this is uh the dollars and cents are stacking up here i can tell you that 95 percent of them say it's not important um but it at the end of the day, um, for some, of course, for some of those, it does become important. Um, there's not many that come through just the player wise and says NIL is important to me. Um, I, I don't think, you know, from the prospect himself, uh, that does not uh, come, you know, a lot of times. But a lot of these kids say NIL is not important, you know, but, but you know, we are going to, you know, look at that. And then, the, of course, the you know, there's family and there's, there's, yeah, I was uh, about to say uh, other, to the, other aspects. To the parents, of that. That's a different answer. We're talking yeah. to the parents. That's a different answer. They say absolutely, it's important because they. And I don't know that I would be that much different as a parent. I mean, if if people are going to be making money off of my son's name, image, and likeness, I would make sure that you know his value is recognized. You know, for what he what he's doing. So I mean, that that you can't blame these these parents. And listen, there's a lot of there's a lot of times that. Just, just giving you reference, guys. This is not small money for some for some of these families. A lot of this is life changing type money. We're talking about you know four, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars over over a, a you know three four year span. So this is not, uh, and those aren't just those aren't exaggerated numbers. Those are real numbers that have, that have been put out there and said. So I mean, it's uh, it's not insignificant money, um, but you know, it's just part of it now, Trent. Yeah, and that's why the recruiting landscape has changed so much. No matter what happens on an official visit, as far as um, your interest and relationship, um, there there's certain prospects that are going to go, uh, you know, with the higher dollar value, and that's just the way it the way NIL's turned into. It's it's uh, more of a family decision or um, it, it, even outside the family decision, more so than the recruits decision, uh, ultimately the recruits decision. Yeah. And I mean, you look at schools that have connections to whether it's certain, certain media markets or certain, you know, corporations or all this kind of stuff, even look down in Orlando, what UCF and Gus Malzahn are doing, they're able to bring in some guys that they probably wouldn't have been able to bring in a couple of years ago. Um, so things are changing a little bit on all those fronts. Um, let's see. Uh, Rome, Georgia. Do you see Georgia with the top signing class on signing day? Quick yes or no? Um, yes. Yes, I believe so too. How close is the race with Ohio State going to be? I, I think they're number I mean, two. Yeah, I think they'll be close. I still think Georgia ends up being the number one. Uh, how do you feel about Bolden and and we already talked about Bolden and, and Williams is he's talking uh, I guess he's talking about Justin just Justin Williams Georgia Georgia Oregon battle there whether you're talking about Williams and Wannery, now that's a little bit different one too I think Georgia has a lot of reason to feel good about that one at this point got him down on campus uh, you know even though 
he ended up not wanting people to know he was going to be on campus. Uh, but he told me and I wrote a story and that was, it, it was what it was. Um, but anyways, he, he made it to campus. Georgia has a momentum there that could go a big way in to helping determine that, that number one class race there, Trent. Yeah. I mean, if you land, uh, two top five players in the country, um, you know, speaking of Raul and, and Williams, that would be, uh, <laughs> go a long ways in landing with, with, with everything else they have. Um, I do think Georgia, you know, they, getting them on campus this last time was big and that was after our, his official visits and, um, you know, able to uh, kind of go and, and pitch their pitch again. And, um, you know, they, they, you know, he, whether he ends up at five tech or outside linebacker or even both, I think Georgia, you know, has a strong case, you know, as of today from, from the pitch that they've, they've, um, you know, went after him with, whether it be, uh, you know, at that five tech or, or at that, he's going to be rushing the passer no matter where. Yeah. I, I think Georgia has good reason to, to feel confident there, right. As, as things stand right now, Missouri, not a team to overlook in that race. Uh, either um just just letting you know suspense 12 do you think the ajc noise has cost us georgia a recruiter too i don't know i don't, i mean i think that i think georgia's uh players in terms of what they have done i mean just facts it, you know it's been it's been sensationalized and there's been it's been hyped up different ways and things like that but Georgia's players, if you just boil down to it, there has been a problem with with speeding, reckless driving. That needs to be addressed. Everybody knows that. Um, so that may be a question that parents are asking about. Hey, what's going on here with the the the, the cars and the fast driving and all that kind of stuff? That may be qu a question that is having to be answered, Trent. But I don't know if it's necessarily the AJC's riding has necessarily cost Georgia a, a recruit. Yeah, I don't. I don't. You know, I don't put much into that. I think, you know, I I think Georgia's players have gotten caught for some uh, reckless driving, and yes, they are guilty of that. But I think it's going on all over the country, and um, oh, yeah. it, whether or not they're getting called at those places, and whether or not they've had, uh, you know, the the death instance that they had that at Georgia is a different story. And I think, you know, of course, Georgia needs to address those issues. But I think that that aspect of, you know being a not 18, 19, 20 year old, it's happened all over the country. And, uh, George is just, you know, you know, been caught and, and has some unfortunate, uh, si situations go on. So I don't think it's been, I don't think it's cost them a recruit, um, up to this point, um, AJC specifically, but I do think there's questions being asked. Middle Tennessee, dog, I'm not saying I want him to, but do you think that Kirby Smart's strategy with NIL will bend a little more towards what other schools are doing? I think over time, you'll see Georgia and its collective and its partners in, in business, all that kind of stuff, maybe maybe change two, three, four years down the road. But right now, Trent, I think with the system that Georgia has in place where basically it is, hey, you're going to come to Georgia, you're going to be taken care of by the collective and some other smaller initiatives early on you know, with NIL, but the real big money is going to come not only when you get to the NFL, but also – with major corporations that that partner with guys like Stetson Bennett and Brock Bowers and stuff like that because they earned it on the field and end up getting that recognition. I think that's kind of the the I think that's the template and the structure you're looking at over the next couple of years at least with this Georgia team and Kirby Smart. And and it's hard to argue that it hasn't worked either um, up to this point because you know they've landed top three classes every year. They they've put. Uh, however many players, 27 players or whatever in the NFL the past two years. I think what they're doing right now is working. Um, and until it, you know, stops working, um, I, you know, there's been, there's been prospects that have received a higher, higher NIL value at other schools that have come back to Georgia and then Georgia, you know, of course says we're not, we're not doing that. And uh, cause that's not the, how Georgia's operating necessarily. And, um, you know, kudos to them uh, for for sticking to their guns and, and not uh, you know falling in that direction. But I, you you, you can see Kirby's always making adjustments, um, whether w whatever part of recruiting he is, because this is what he lives for. He lives for recruiting. But um, I think he's going to do what's best for the program um, and continue to do that moving forward. 
What's up, Don says, when all is said and done, how many five stars will Georgia sign? Disclaimer, we won't hold you to it, but we appreciate that. <laughs> Not let me just hold us to it here on the July 3rd. But when all is said and done, how many five stars does Georgia sign in this class, Trent? I mean, how many five stars they have now? I, don't know. I can honestly say I haven't looked at the rankings. Um, they, they got two. They got they got Woodyard and Raul right now. So I I, I think Ellis Robinson and Nykar are two players that could end up in five star uh, as a five star. I think uh, you know I, I would put that number possibly at six with what Georgia has that could come into the five star status or move out. I think um, you know five six number would be something to look at but i do think as far as rival rivals 100 guys that's a different story i think george is gonna land a buttload of those oh yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting randy hall he says hey uh kirby alters nil deal tell him to get advice from julie's bookkeeping for sure appreciate the shout out there he can, kirby call up julie julie the bookkeeper she'll help you out with everything um but i agree i think that number is uh, there's going to be a range depending on how the guys get ranked in the end. I think that that number is going to range from four to six. So I think you're going to see somewhere between four and six, five stars that end up signing um, when the, when the final rankings are done here with rivals. Um, and it definitely could go even go, I mean, you land guys like Justin Williams and uh, Williams, um, the Williams uh, crew. If you land those two guys, it could even go up to seven. Um, it's just, you know, what, what Georgia is able to uh, land down the stretch. I think those are two guys that, you know, still on the board, still possible, and I think could push to seven, but four to six range would be, um, you know, uh, the, the better guess. I think uh, I think there's, there's a question here, and I don't have it on the screen, but the question is from uh, Big Fatty 94. It says, do the vast majority underestimate what Georgia is doing with NIL currently? I think that's a trick question because – I think people assume Georgia's won back-to-back -back national championships and money just auto, money just should be just flowing in and things like that. I don't think that's necessarily been the case in terms of the 21 club for the, C the CCC, the uh, Class City Collective. I don't think it's got as much support as they maybe thought it would or hoped it would have. A lot of the 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 a lot of it's been buoyed by donations from mega donors. Uh, just you know, a few, a few mega donors really floating check a million and a half here, <laughs> a million there, stuff like that. So I don't know. It's kind of a tricky question when you get in there and we could have a whole separate show on that. I, and then it, he also asked how many surprises are we feeling in this class? Unless you count a guy like, uh, you know, Cam Michael ended up being a surprise joining this class or, or, you know, a late flip uh, of, a, of a Jeremiah Smith, which would, would be a surprise at this point. I mean, I know that George got a great, relationship and they keep things up but those would really be the two i guess surprises maybe you would look for in this class trent yeah and i you know the one thing kirby smart's done the last couple of years even with the nil is he's been able to flip guys late and uh and majority of those guys that we're discussing we were not even talking about in the summer so you could look at um you know, I think Florida's going to have a down year. Look at their commit list. I, I mean, it, look at it, Andrew Paul a couple of years ago. You know, but, so there, there's a, uh, you know, things are going to change. Georgia could possibly, uh, in, you know, it, it always happens. Georgia loses a commit or two and looking to make some late additions to the class and, uh, and they are able to flip a couple of players that we were not even talking about in the summer. So we'll continue to monitor that. But, you know, I think there will be a couple of surprises, but we couldn't list those names, uh, you know, right now, other than the guys that we've talked about. Thank all of you guys for tuning in. Hit that like button. There's there's hundreds of you in here right now. Hit the like button. That helps us out a lot with the analytics, all that kind of stuff. So just hit the thumbs up. It's free. Subscribe if you haven't already. We're approaching the 37,000 sub mark. Uh, and then also make sure you hit that notification bell to know when we go live, when when – Coach Donnan goes live with Roddy and Dane, uh, Paul and the guys on the Sunday crew. Lots of great content live. And also you got uh, Dane, Dane and Brent that do their film don't lie stuff. So there is a ton of content being put out here and you can get it all by making sure you subscribe. It's free. Make sure you are a member of the UGA Sports Vault. We'll answer your questions. It's a community over there. We'll interact with you. 
uh, and support the sponsor of our show, which is presented by Julie's Bookkeeping. Go to godogs.juliethebookkeeper.com to get your 30-minute free consultation today. For Trent Smallwood, I am Blaine Gilmer, and we will catch you guys next time on UGA Sports, Rumors versus Facts. <laughs>